Hey, good morning, beloved. Happy Sunday. You look good. You're smiling face. Your eyes are smiling over here. Thank you. <laughs> you look good. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 because we want to, to uh, finish our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Not that we're through with it because it's not through with us. And, and uh, the amazing uh, Sermon on the Mount, the most powerful sermon ever preached because it's Jesus' message and he preached it. And I hope that even though this series, we've come to the conclusion of it, but that you will continue to spend a time, a regular time, in the Sermon on the Mount, going over it. We've gone through it pretty briefly and uh, just kind of giving you a structure but to understand that the Sermon on the Mount is about life in the kingdom. And this is the theme of Jesus in all of his preaching, all of his teaching, all of his miracles pointing us to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Father who is in heaven. And so life in the kingdom is what the Sermon on the Mount is about. And life in the kingdom is the life of the Son. I've said that about a hundred or so times over these weeks that we've been here. But I hope that you'll understand and interpret it in that way. This is not a standard for you to try to attain. No. This is something that's already been done. This is a life that's already been lived and offered to us. The Sermon on the Mount is the greatest evangelistic and uh, sermon in the Bible. It is an invitation to a new life, the life that's in Jesus Christ. And by faith in Christ, you can have his life as your life. Amen. Well, all through it, we've seen the stark comparisons that Jesus has made. The comparison between uh, uh, assault and light in the world without, in a world of darkness and in a world of decay. The stark comparison between uh, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, in other words, religious righteousness and righteousness that Jesus offers which is entrance into the kingdom Jesus said unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees you will never enter the kingdom and then the the comparison between giving praying and fasting of religious people and giving praying and fasting that the father looks for in that secret place in your heart where he sees faith, where no one else can see, but God the Father sees. And then the comparison, oh, it just goes on and on. The, the two uh, uh, builders and the two foundations that we look at today. So, Matthew, 20, Matthew 7, beginning in verse 24, let's look at these verses, the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. You know, your first prayer when you read and listen to the Sermon on the Mount is to pray for that eye-opening astonishment that we recognize the authority of Jesus Christ in saying what he is saying and we listen to him and not just listen to him but hear him and then do what he says and Jesus puts up the the comparisons for us throughout the Sermon on the Mount to recognize the great strength that God gave our lives the ability to choose that we, can, that we are free to choose. We are created free moral beings in the image of God. And we can choose to believe, uh, to recognize, and to believe. 
and this is the first step. And and then and so he he appeals to that highest uh, aspect, the highest characteristic of our life, that we can choose to believe what he has said, to choose and to recognize his authority and be astonished. And kind of like that, that river that Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 47, look at it later this afternoon, in Ezekiel 47, I believe it's 47, uh, the angel shows Ezekiel that new Jerusalem, and he says, coming up out of the, the, from the throne is a fountain that flows in all directions, this river that flows in all directions. And the angel told Ezekiel, wade out into it. Remember that one? And he walked out there ankle deep. Wow. Then he said, no, go out a little further. And he went further, and the further he went, the deeper it got. Amen. Well, the teachings of Jesus is like that river. The more you walk in these teachings, the deeper they go. And that's why I want to encourage you to stay in these three chapters often and, and continue to pray to learn the teachings of Jesus because Jesus said, the one who hears these words of mine and does them is like the wise man. The one who hears these words and does not do them is like the foolish man. Now, right away, we have already heard Jesus talk about this, these false teachers who say and do, but they are false teachers nonetheless because their heart is they don't know Jesus and Jesus doesn't know them. But And so here he's saying, now the wise and the foolish, the one who hears and does what I say is the wise man. And, of course, in Matthew 13, when you read the, the famous parable, the parable of all parables, actually, Jesus said, of the four soils. Remember that one? There was the hard soil, the hard path. His word falls there. Birds come and get it. Then the shallow soil, which is the rocky area. The word falls there. And the starts to grow, but no root. When the sun comes, it withers and dies. Then the seed falls on crowded soil where there's a lot of weeds, and, and, uh, uh, and, it's, and Jesus said it chokes the word, and it cannot produce. It won't have fruit. And then there's the good soil. In all four, it says, this is the one who hears. 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 But it's only that last one, the good soil, that produces the fruit. Fruit is the doing. And, and, and we've got to understand from the very beginning that when we hear that, our first, our, our automatic response to that is, okay, I'll try. I'll just have to try harder because I'm not doing very well and I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it, so I guess I'll just have to try harder. Listen, beloved, that's the flesh. The flesh wants to try to do it. And, here's the, and, and your flesh will tell you, oh, pride. Pride will tell you, come on, suck it up and let's do it. Come on, you can do it. Just keep trying and maybe you'll catch on. And two, two horrible things either happen with that. One, you can't. You're honest with yourself and you realize I can't do it and you're condemned. And beloved, let me tell you something. When you feel condemned, that's not God. God does not condemn. And or the other thing, even worse You'll actually deceive yourself into thinking that you are doing it and you get puffed up with pride. Good grief. Don't go there. <laughs> Don't go either one of those places. God does not, listen, God does not give us commandments in order that we might do them. Why would he do that? God commands us to reveal, listen, what he wants to do in you, with you, through you, and as you for his glory. And your joy and strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And so when we read the commandments, whether Old Testament or New Testament, know this. This is revealing something of what God wants to do. What God wants to do in me. With me. He won't do it without you. Through me. For, uh, the, as me before the Father and the watching world around me. And so 
uh, we understand that when we hear, when Jesus says the wise man is the one who hears and does, not in our effort, not with us trying, but trusting, trusting him to do it. And of course, we're talking about not just actions because remember what James says in James chapter 2? James talks about faith and works, faith and doing. He says, don't have demon faith. You know what demon faith is, don't you? James chapter 2 says demons believe and even tremble. <laughs> but uh, you don't want to have, so it's more than just obedience. Demons obeyed Jesus, didn't they? Oh, yeah, they did. Not willingly, but they obeyed him. When he cast them out, they went. And when he told them to shut up, they did. That's demon faith. So we've got to understand that the hearing and doing is the teaching of Jesus that runs all through the Bible. And I love the way it's brilliant, the comparison between the two builders. Now, I'll tell you, growing up in Sunday school, or at least where I went to Sunday school growing up, they had a poster about this parable, and it was deceiving. I, I, I was... I, I, I got the wrong impression. Here's the reason. Because it showed the two houses, and the wise man was way up there on a bluff, kind of looking down on that guy building on the sand down there. <laughs> and uh, no, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus does not say, where you build makes you the, is the difference between wise and foolish. It's upon what you build. And besides that, both houses... We're subject to the same storm, and one of that one element of it was floods. You can't flood something way up on high on the high ground. That's why I knew that poster was wrong. No, it wasn't where, and it doesn't make any difference what kind of material you use either. You see, there's really we don't have a choice as to where we live. No, you may think we do, but no, God is the one who determines the place. We don't have any choice about what we're given to build with. But everybody must build. Some people are given certain opportunities and others are not. Some are given certain talents and some are not. Some are given suffering and some are given ease. We don't have a choice over what we're given to build with. What we are given is the choice upon which we will build. And Jesus is telling us, that those that choose to hear and do his teaching, hear and do his teaching, will be building upon the rock. Luke, in Luke 6, Luke tells us about the one who digs deep to the rock. And so there's a little effort there. And grace, listen, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Well, we see uh, uh, the two difference. One, the one who uh, is wise and foresees, worst case scenario, foresees difficulty. And the other one, all he can see is a beautiful view, the ocean view. Oh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> and don't work too hard, just build it on the sand. The whole book of Proverbs talks about this kind of comparison. That's why I hope that you have some portion of reading from the Proverbs as a part of your everyday reading. Jesus loved the book of Proverbs. You see so much of his teaching coming from that. I believe because Proverbs is the father speaking to his child. All through it, father speaking to his child. Hear my son, hear my child. Treasure my saying, my word. Recognize it's more valuable than anything you could desire. All through the book of Proverbs. And that's why Jesus talked about God as Father. Our Father in heaven. And the stark comparison that is shown us in that teaching. Well, as we say, okay, I want to be wise. I want to build upon the solid rock, the foundation it's not a location. It's upon something. It's upon the teachings of Jesus. And I want to make sure I hear and do. Not with demon faith, but with a genuine heart. 
I want to be obedient to what Jesus is saying. I don't do it on my own power. I, I want to rely upon him and trust in him that he will do it. So how do you do that? Oh, that's the question, isn't it? Help me to know how that can happen. Well, I'm glad you're asking that. Because it starts with, as we've already said, how do I do what Jesus has said? And that, that immediately is another mountain range that runs all through the Bible. Believe. Believe. Remember that crowd that went to Jesus in John chapter 6 and said, what must we do to do the works of God? That's what we're saying right here. What must we do to do the works of God? You remember what Jesus said? Believe in the one whom he sent. That would be Jesus. Believe in the one whom he has sent. And so all of this starts with the willing choice that you make to believe that Jesus desires to do this in me. All the teachings that you hear in Matthew 5, in Matthew 6, in Matthew 7, that we've been going over and emphasizing all this time. Life in the kingdom. How do I do that? It starts with faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in what? First of all, believing that Jesus desires to do this in me. That he, what he has promised, he will do because he is faithful. And so I believe. I put my confidence, my trust in Jesus Christ. Now, what that leads to then is a prayer. Because I realize I, this is not in me. And I hear his teachings about anger, and about lust, and about manipulating people with a lot of words, oaths, trying to build up your words, and trying to manipulate people to believe you with a whole lot of extra barrage of stuff and retaliation and loving your enemies good grief possibly no way are we going to love those other people that cheat and you know and on and on love them pray for them bless them i can't do that jesus didn't have any trouble at all or else you and i would not even be here today and so we we trust that Jesus Christ wants to change me. And so I desire that. I desire it, and prayer is desire. I start praying that and admitting that I, I don't know how to do that. And I want to. I want to be a learner of, of doing that. You know, I love the vision and mission statement of this church. It's on every bulletin. And the vision is a, is a statement of being. We are a great commission church. Amen. And, uh, but what is the great commission? All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so as you go, make disciples of all nations. You know, we don't have a place. Jesus didn't say, call out to everybody to come here. Come here. No. We don't have a place. Other religions tell you to come here, and there's a location. No, Jesus said, go out. And our faith is not a location. Our faith is a person, Jesus Christ. And if we say come, we say come to him. Come to, but he sent us out into all the world to make disciples of all people. Now, what is a disciple? A disciple is a person who desires to be with Jesus in order to be like Jesus because they're learning of Jesus. Amen. That's a disciple. Wants to be with him, to be like him because we are learning how to do that, learning his life that he has given. And all nations, regardless of the culture, regardless of the age, Regardless of the opportunity or not opportunity, regardless of sick or well, regardless of rich or poor, regardless of what it is, we can continually learn more and more of being like Jesus from Jesus because we are with him. And then he said, baptizing them in the name of, singular, in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, I hate to tell us this. I know we're Baptists and everything. We baptized and we saw one. But that verse is dry. <laughs> There's other verses that will tell us of the symbolism of, of water baptism. We can use those. But when Jesus gave us the Great Commission, he's talking about immersing them in the Trinitarian presence in the name of. The name of means present, reality, what is real. Amen. <laughs> The name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. Immerse them in the Trinitarian presence of God with them right now. Listen, that's good news when you want to be a disciple. That the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, is with you wherever you go. Then teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you. There you go. And so we are commanded to, as a disciple to be a learner of everything Jesus has commanded, knowing this is not something he wants us to do. It's something that he wants to do in us, with us. Through, have you got that? Just nod your head. Good. Amen. And as us, before the Father and the watching world around us. Thank you for watching on television or the Internet. I don't want to overlook you. <laughs> Nod your head if you believe that. Good, amen. We got 90% at least there. Seriously. How do we learn to do the things that Jesus has promised to do in us? Well, of course, you've got to have a Bible. <laughs> you've got to hear what Jesus commanded. And beloved, the Sermon on the Mount is overflowing with his commands. Overflowing. You know what the first command of the Sermon on the Mount? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's the first imperative in that sermon, Matthew 5. And of course the context is the, the end of the introduction called the Beatitudes. Blessed are you and men revile you, persecute you say all manner of evil against you falsely for my, on my account. It's called false accusations and persecution and loss. What does Jesus say? Cry about it, moan about it, complain about it. Oh, we should have won the election. Oh, he doesn't say that. He says rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. And so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Beloved, you've got to learn to do that. It does not come natural. Have you ever been falsely accused of something? Have you ever had the deck stacked against you like that? And been reviled and slandered? Most people don't rejoice and they're certainly not exceedingly glad. <laughs> this is something to learn by trusting Jesus, he certainly was, and it didn't change his countenance. It didn't change his focus or his activity. And, to, and so we, when you look at this, you go through, that's the first of many, many commands. And we've talked about them, about anger and lust and uh, the uh, manipulation of others with oaths and retaliation and hating enemies and and uh, uh, and worry and ju and judging other all through this sermon on the mount you've got a ton of things to learn and i want to tell you i've never seen outside of church on a sign a bible study that's advertised oh come we're studying how to overcome anger and loving our enemies you are you interested i've never seen advertised please come to our bible study tonight how to, how to overcome lusting after, after within, with lustful in, intent of the opposite gender. Never seen that. I don't think I've ever attended a Bible. Now, I have done one on my own, which, by the way, beloved, if there's anything that we have learned the last eight months is we've got a lot of, do, we've got a lot of personal work to do. We've got a lot of personal time. We may not be able to gather in groups that does not excuse me from worship or Bible study. In fact, there is a priority of personal worship, personal Bible study. 
And so when we hear Jesus make this, this grand invitation to be like the wise man who hears and does his teaching, I've got to ask myself, where am I on that learning? And, and if I say, no, I've already learned how to do that, oh, that's a terrible confession to make. That's like saying, I've already been ankle deep in that river. I don't want to go any deeper. Oh, I'm telling you, beloved, there is more. <laughs> there is more to it than what you know. And I think even an unbeliever like Aristotle or whatever he was, Aristotle said it's the, it's the uh, ignorant man who... <laughs> It's the ignorant man who thinks he's educated that's the real danger in our world. No, learning is first a humble experience when you say, I do not know, but I desire to. I desire to. And then the digging begins. Then the great effort is done. And so to believe that Jesus Christ desires to do this, and then to pray, to pray uh, for uh, this particular teaching. Now, I've given you this before, but I'm going to go ahead and take the extra time to give it to you again. Well, some of you weren't here back in February when we had the sermon on the learner's prayer. Remember the learner's prayer? Don't nod your head. Uh, the learner's prayer. Psalm, here it is. Psalm 119, verse 9 through 16. Psalm 119 is the second section, the, for the letter B is what was in the Hebrew alphabet, the second section of that great Psalm 119. I call it the learner's prayer because here's how it, it begins with a question. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. You see, that's the purpose for learning. Not, not to intellect, not information, holiness. That's the reason. Uh, with my whole heart, I seek you, Lord. Let me not wander from your commandments. You can't do this half-heartedly. It calls for your whole heart. Uh, your word I've hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. It's God's word. It's God's word that we learn these teachings. And then the very first lesson, blessed are you, O oh Lord. Teach me your statute. We recognize the teacher who is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who will teach us holiness. He is the one who will speak to us from his word. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. You can't leave your body out of the teaching. You must incorporate all of you. Spirit, soul, and body are, must come together. And so start with confessing that. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. In other words, you've got to recognize the value of this teaching or you'll never learn it. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. You've got to get your mind into this. You know, beloved, you can't, when you start, you, let me put it this way. Boy. You will do what you think about. <laughs> How hard is that to say? <laughs> you will do what you think about. And our problem is we don't think much about what we think about. And we let our mind govern and dictate the thoughts, and then your behavior follows that. And then we wonder, why do I keep doing what I don't want to do? It has to do with your thinking. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You start, I'm trying to say this, you start meditating on the Word of God and your actions will change. But you've got to make the willful decision to spend that time and there's a sacrifice in that. But you can determine and decide what you think about if you'll think about what you think about. Amen. I will meditate. That's how you learn. To engage your mind in that. Not during your quiet time and then nothing the rest of the day, but throughout the day as you rehearse this, I will enjoy, he says, your precept, your statutes. Oh, that's like sitting down after five hours on a Traeger grill. Those baby backs come out. I will enjoy, oh, man. 
said, some of them are left over. I'm going to hurry up now. I'm thinking about that. Oh, listen, until you recognize the value and start to enjoy the teachings of God, you will never do them. You will never trust Jesus to do them. You're not that interested. But when you start enjoying what God is saying in his word, listen, nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop you. I will not forget the learner's prayer. Learn the learner's prayer. In other words, then you review it. You go over it again. You don't say, now I learned it, I'm ready to go on to something else. No, you review it again. And so, beloved, let me give you an assignment. I gotta, you got to remember, you got to remember this starts how? Believe that Jesus desires to do this. And so you desire it. You start praying. And then you decide your will. I will. I will. I will sacrifice this time so that I can do this. I will. Determine. So fight. World of flesh and the listen. You enter into a battle when you decide and determine to do this and so you've got to determine and then do it and then do it and watch God then what he can do with someone who trusts in his son and so here's your assignment we're getting ready to enter into the holy days the holiday holidays they call it but it's holy days Thanksgiving Christmas and next Sunday we'll start those those messages but uh, during the Holy days, take another look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I want you to find a verse in each of those chapters. Memorize it, because you can't meditate on something you hadn't memorized. And find, well, ask the Lord to show you what area he wants to correct, he wants to do, and you to prune. And uh, it may be with that anger, it may be lust, it may be those oaths, that manipulation with words. Maybe that retaliation, vengeance, or the enemy thing, loving enemies, or maybe that not worrying or giving, praying, and fasting area, or not worrying, seem like that's a big one today, or judging, even a bigger one today. Don't judge others. Judge the kind of help that you get. You know, we've gone through it. Find that verse and uh, meditate on it. Pray it. Meditate on that throughout the holidays, and wow, what a gift God will give you as new behavior begins to be shared. Salt and light that makes a difference in our world. Amen and hallelujah.